Welcome to Checking In, a Scottish Rite for Children podcast, where we'll share up-to-date expertise on children's muscles, joints, and bones. Scottish Rite for Children is one of the nation's leading pediatric orthopedic centers. Since 1921, we have been committed to caring for the whole child, mind, body, and spirit. Today, our world-renowned medical staff treats a wide range of pediatric orthopedic conditions, including sports injuries and fractures. Our specialists also excel in the treatment of related arthritic and neurological conditions, as well as learning disorders like dyslexia. Through outstanding care and compassion, Scottish Rite has become a place of hope. We are dedicated to beating the odds in the face of adversity because it's our mission to give children back their childhood. And now, your host, Jennifer Bowden. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Checking In. Today, we are discussing uh, complex adolescent hip conditions with Dr. Dan Cicado. Uh, welcome back to Checking In, Dr. Cicado. How are you? Good, Jennifer. Glad to be back. Thanks for joining us today. We want to talk all about um, adolescent hip conditions and some of the more complex adolescent hip conditions that we treat. Can you kind of give us a definition uh, about, you know, what are the most common adolescent hip conditions we that we see here at Scottish Rite? So I think the common ones, so first off, we'll call adolescents older than 10 years of age. And the things that we see in patients who present to us are things like hip dysplasia, where the hip socket is uh, positioned not in a perfect way, and so it can result in hip pain and early osteoarthritis. Um, that sort of, uh, you could also categorize that as a little bit of hip instability because the socket isn't wrapped around the ball part of the hip as well as you would like. On the opposite extreme of that is something called femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, which has taken on a big uh, role in medicine over the last 20 years or so. And that's almost the opposite, where there's almost too much of a tight relationship between the ball, the femoral side, and the acetabulum. Um, and so those are those two conditions are fairly related, but in an opposite way. Uh, and then we see things like uh, growth plate injuries, like slip capital femoral epiphysis, where the ball part of the hip slips through the growth plate. We also can see things like um, bony avulsions, where the bone gets pulled a little way off of its original site by strong muscles through a little bit of a growth plate. And those are injuries we see that are more acute. So those are, those are a little bit of the general things that we see with respect to adolescents and their hips. Okay. A lot can go on in that hip, <laughs> especially as the kiddos get older. Um, you know, when the kids, when they are adolescents at this point in that development, how is that adolescent hip condition diagnosed? Well, usually we see uh, kids uh, in that adolescent period come to us with the primary symptom is pain. And so it's really important to understand when that pain started. Was it a gradual onset? Was it an acute onset? Uh, is it a sharp pain? Is it sort of a dull pain? Is it activity related? Uh, the location of the pain is really important. And so we make a big distinction between pain in one part of the hip versus pain in the other part of the hip to try to then focus in on to figure out where what is the pain generator? Where, what is the problem uh, that uh, is happening in the hip? And when you're differentiating in between, uh, you know, common hip pain, normal hip pain versus a condition, what, what else do you use? X-rays, examinations, like what kind of tools do you use? Yeah. Great question. So I think, first off, the history is really important. So, you know, kids who play a lot of sports, for example, they may come home and tell mom and dad, you know, my hip's bothering me. And within a day or two, it's gone. I mean, that's different than, okay, my pain hurts. I've backed off. I'm still playing and practicing and training, but I'm not playing in games because it bothers me a little bit too much. And so we've backed off a little bit and it's still going on. That sort of pain is different. And so we try to make that distinction. So we use all sorts of different diagnostic tools. The history is really important. The physical exam is really important. And so we can, uh, we can really get down to uh, narrowing the diagnoses down by a good history and a good physical exam. 
So the physical is really important. What's the range of motion like? Do they have any contractures or restricted motion? Do they have pain with certain uh, maneuvers? So there's a whole host of things uh, and maneuvers that we do to see if we can get that pain to show up again. And if, is it the same type of pain that they have or is it a different type of pain? And then we go to images like x-rays, um, and there's a number of different ways we view the hip in x-rays. Uh, if we then need to go further with advanced imaging, quote-unquote advanced imaging, there's things like MRIs and CT scans, um, and there's ultrasound is also, uh, I would call, an advanced imaging uh, modality that we use. Okay. Uh, you know, aside from pain, are there any other common symptoms of some of these adolescent hip conditions that we see a lot? So pain is probably the number one thing, but things uh, that we always want to make sure is there's no fevers associated with it. So infection can happen in hips. It can happen spontaneously. Children are a little bit more likely to have a uh, infection of the bone or the joint or the muscle. Um, they're not very common, but it's more common in children than it is in adults. And so if there's fever, if there's things like I've lost my appetite, I um, just don't feel well, my energy level's low, those are all things that go along with infection. We always worry about other things. Um, I mean, tumors can happen in bone. Tumors can happen in soft tissues. And so things like pain that happens at nighttime that wakes the children from sleep. So not my pain, my hip hurts and I have difficulty going to sleep. It's the finding of I'm sleeping and in the middle of the night, my pain in my hip wakes me from sleep. That's a little bit more concerning for to us uh, for other things besides sort of mechanical uh, conditions that we typically see in orthopedics. And I know we talk about this frequently throughout all of our uh, diagnoses conversations, but why is it important to come to a pediatric orthopedic specialist when you have these type of hip complaints? Uh, it's important because the growth plate is something that is different in children than it is in adults. You don't have a growth plate as an adult. Uh, there's specific conditions uh, that are associated with the growth plate. Uh, there's certainly things that we see in children that are not common in adults, and so identifying those. There's uh, underlying conditions that play a role in children's hips that we don't necessarily see in adults. There's syndromic conditions that we see uh, in children that in the adult population they're not as familiar with. And so uh, the, the diagnoses and the conditions that we see are in part different. Um, the children, you know, coming to a pediatric institution where it's bright lights and bright colors and, you know, child life is here and the physical therapist is a pediatric therapist and the uh, child life is obviously a child life therapist. They're all pediatric and the orthopedists are pediatric. The nursing team is pediatric. Everybody in the place is pediatric. Pediatric. And so that makes a difference because it's not the diagnosis and the treatment alone. It's the patient experience and the patient and the family. If they haven't had a great experience, I'm not so sure it matters how much care you provide to them. The, the patient experience has to be really good. Right. That makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. Talk a little bit about what can cause some of these adolescent hip conditions. So the cause of, uh, let's say, hip dysplasia, for example, that could be uh, hip dysplasia could be a silent dysplasia that's uh, not seen until they're an adolescent and then they're bigger, taller, heavier, and they're more active. And so the joint is being stressed more and so they see it only as an adolescent. But that could have been early on when they were first born. Developmental dysplasia of the hip is something that we see in newborns where the hip is just a little bit loose. It could actually be dislocated. Um, and so the pediatricians are really good about doing a good exam as a newborn, and they often refer the patients uh, to us. And in that scenario, we often do a physical exam, and that's where the ultrasound is really important. An ultrasound is a beautiful exam of the hip when you're a newborn because your bone isn't all bone at that point, it's still cartilage. And the ultrasound can see that, whereas an x-ray can't see that. And so for hip dysplasia, a previous history of DDH or developmental dysplasia, the hip's important. Uh, understanding their uh, birth history, so firstborn female breach and family history, those are the four big risk factors for dysplasia. So understanding that is important. Um, the other conditions that uh, may have happened earlier, uh, things uh, like uh, Perthes disease, which can have as the ball part of the hip heals, it heals in a way that's not perfectly round, and it 
then can lead to femoroacetabular impingement, which you won't see until they're an adolescent because the ball part of the hip is impinging up, uh, upon the socket because the ball part of the hip isn't round. The socket is more round, and so you can get femoroacetabular impingement. So really understanding the pediatric conditions when they're young is really important to understand where they are as an adolescent and even as a young adult. And so ye seeing those patients uh, throughout the continuum is really important sometimes. How about injuries? Can an injury cause any of these conditions? Yeah, so uh, as children get to be more active in sports, the injury or the activity can bring out hip dysplasia symptoms. Uh, a an acute injury can result in these avulsions through the growth plate. So uh, in children, there's a lot of, um, in, in our hips, there's muscles that start at the bone and then travel down the leg and insert somewhere else in the bone. And so where they start in the bone is um, associated with a growth plate. And if they're in that period of time where the muscles are strong and the growth plates are weak, then the muscle can pull the bone off of its uh, site. And so that's um, called an avulsion. And there's uh, four or five places around the hip that that can happen. My uh, youngest son actually had that happen about a year, almost a year ago now. And uh, it's a very painful thing. He was playing soccer. He'd been complaining about a little bit of hip symptoms. And, and then all of a sudden he had an avulsion and it's very, very painful. Fortunately, the vast majority of those heal with time. Operative treatment is occasionally necessary for the ones that happen uh, with, that are associated with the hamstring muscle, but uh, the vast majority of them can be healed uh, without any, any side effects or any surgical treatment whatsoever. So other things that injuries uh, are related to hip conditions include labral tears in the hip socket. And so that's a soft tissue, sort of think of like an O-ring around the hip socket that helps protect the hip. And uh, with continued activities and with an acute injury, you can have a labral tear. And so those things can happen with activities. You're listening to Checking In, a Scottish Right for Children podcast. Do you have a story to tell? We want to hear it. Sharing your experience with us can provide inspiration to other patients and shine light on our mission of giving children back their childhood. Whether you are a current or former patient or family member, we invite you to share your journey with us. To submit your information, visit scottishrightforchildren.org forward slash share your story. Welcome back to Checking In, a Scottish Right for Children podcast. Switching gears kind of into, you know, treatment for some of these conditions. I know you talked a little bit about the, some of the surgical treatments, but talk about um, some of our, some of our non-operative treatment options. What do we do um, outside of surgery to treat these hip conditions? The vast majority of uh, hip conditions in adolescents can be treated non-operatively. And uh, so some of the things that are very, very beneficial are good physical therapy. So think about when you have an injury or when you have pain, you sort of favor that leg. The muscles get weak. As the muscles get weak, pain can happen because you're creating a little bit of instability in the hip. That then leads to more pain and then less use. And so good physical therapy from a very good pediatric therapist uh, goes a long, long way to making symptoms better. Um, and so oftentimes it's just keeping that hip strong until the bone heals, like in an avulsion, for example. Uh, even femoral acetabular impingement, there are studies to suggest that uh, good physical therapy and not necessarily repairing a small labral tear will get that patient back feeling normal and getting their strength back and getting them back to the activities, including high-level sporting activities. Uh, and so physical therapy is really, really important. Um, there's other things that we sort of really uh, focus on, getting good rest. You know, the teenage population doesn't sleep well. You can't heal unless you have good rest, good nutrition, um, good anti-inflammatory. So a good anti-inflammatory medication to help break the cycle of inflammation that oftentimes happens with injuries or with hip pain is very uh, beneficial. And these are all non-addictive sort of medications that can be used very, very safely. And there's a whole host of them. And we try to run through them. And sometimes one works and uh, some one doesn't work and you move to the next one and that works very well. So it's oftentimes a multidisciplinary approach. Physical therapy, good rest, good nutrition, good anti-inflammatory, warming up with 
before therapy, cooling down after are always good uh, principles to stick by uh, for the treatment. And is with the physical therapy, does that involve some type of activity restriction within their sports? Yeah, that's a great point. I was uh, going to say that too. I think that uh, there's a balance of giving your your injury or your pain time to rest while you're getting your muscle strength back. And oftentimes that's not a complete rest. Sometimes you just have to back off. Sometimes the these adolescents are just almost doing too much and they just need to back off and give their body some time to heal while also allowing them to participate in the activities that they love. And so instead of playing in games every weekend in tournaments, that they're training two days a week with their team, understanding that they have pain in the middle of training, they, they can back off. And so trying to maintain the, the activities that they love to do is important important for, for their happiness and, and getting on to healing. Right. And I know a, a lot of us have learned how to kind of incorporate physical therapy into their sports warm-ups or activity warm-ups and cool down. So I think that's that brings reassurance for our patients and our families. Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of talk about what what's the most t- common type of surgery that you do for um, adolescent hip conditions here? Probably here the most common operative diagnoses or the diagnoses that bring us to surgery are hip dysplasia, where the shape of the socket is essentially normal, but it's just not in a great position. It doesn't form a nice, think about uh, the ball part of the hip and having a nice roof over it. And if that roof is a little tilted and you're sort of edge loading, you're putting most of your weight on the edge of the socket, that socket is going to wear out with time. It's going to cause pain early on in the adolescent period. And then long term, it's going to cause uh, arthritis that will lead to uh, early hip replacement. So a surgery for hip dysplasia is where we we basically cut the socket free from the pelvis and it allows us to reorient the socket. We fix it then with uh, three or four screws that heals all in. And now the socket and the ball part of the hip have a much better relationship. So that's one of the big ones. For femoral acetabular impingement, um, probably the most common type of surgery is hip arthroscopy. Through two small incisions, you look inside the hip joint and then you can address most of the pathology that we see with femoral acetabular impingement. And that could be reshaping the ball part of the hip. It could be uh, fixing the labrum. It uh, will also entail sometimes reshaping the socket a little bit if you have really significant femoral acetabular impingement. So hip arthroscopy has been really a a great advance in the last 20 years or so. Uh, And you really need specialized folks that uh, have special training in that. And we have that here at Scottish Rite. Good good to know. Is the type of treatment, you know, surgical versus non-surgical, is that is that determined by the patient's age or is it more driven by, you know, what's going on with the patient? Yeah, I think it's both. I think in the younger patient, we try to avoid we try to avoid surgery in general. And in fact, even if we think we're going down the surgical road, it's really important that a non-operative treatment is tried first. Even just because you have radiographic uh, evidence of hip dysplasia and you have symptoms doesn't mean you need an operation. Uh, sometimes that uh, hip dysplasia sets you up for having a little bit more pain and you had a little bit of an uh, injury and then your muscles get weak and then you go down that vicious cycle that I was talking about. And just good physical therapy is helpful in that scenario. Chronic pain we treat uh, also with, uh, and I didn't mention this earlier, but our psychology team has been incredibly helpful as a uh, one of the mainstays of getting kids back to their normal activities, getting them on the way to healing, because they are very good uh, with uh, helping communicate and having a good open lines of communication with what their pain is like, how it's affecting their the things that they love to do. They have great strategies on uh, providing the children on, on ways to deal with their pain from a cognitive, mental, psychological standpoint. So those things are really important. In terms of surgery, uh, it depends on how they come out of that therapy non-operative program, if they still have symptoms, and if we can tell that the symptoms are coming from that anatomical uh, problem, then surgery uh, is beneficial at that point. Okay. I know that, um, you know, we evaluate our patients in, in several different clinics throughout the hospital, but let's talk a little bit about um, our complex hip clinic. I know that's kind of a unique clinic that you participate in, along with several other of our surgeons. Uh, kind of talk about that clinic. Why did, why did we develop this, this complex hip clinic? Yeah, the complex hip clinic came out of the reality that, uh, that we, we sort of realized that things are getting more complex in terms of we have so many tools to take care of. Uh, 
patients in general. So, and the tools that we've already mentioned, most of them, but on the surgical side, there are specialized uh, surgical procedures that uh, not any one surgeon can do in their entirety. So hip arthroscopy, we have Henry Ellis, who's uh, one of our talented sports uh, physician surgeons uh, who has specialized training in hip arthroscopy, spent uh, a year doing uh, a fellowship in sports medicine and it focused uh, on hip arthroscopy. So he's in the clinic. Uh, there's uh, several, a couple of us that do open hip surgery for acetabular dysplasia uh, and uh, as well as femoral acetabular impingement. So uh, there's three of us that do that. We have somebody who's, uh, that, that includes myself, Dr. Pedeswa, and Dr. Morris, Will Morris, who's our young staff. And then we have uh, Dr. Harry Kim, who has a special expertise in avascular necrosis and is you know, one of the world's, if not the world's expert on Perthes disease. So he's there and has a big interest in all of hip conditions, but has a super expertise in that. Uh, and then we have uh, somebody who does adult work. And so we have a nice collaboration with UT Southwestern in general. And so uh, Dr. Joel Wells comes over and uh, he is uh, does open hip surgery, does some hip arthroscopy too, but his expertise that we utilize in our clinic is on the adult side. And so when it comes to a question of can this hip be preserved with non-hip uh, replacement type of procedures. That conversation happens with him, who does, and he does a hip, a total hip arthroplasty. And so I think that that adds to it. So uh, the reality is now we can take care of children from birth to young adult, and we have lots of different perspective um, that, that comes to the table on each of these patients. Uh, we refer patients internally, and they come from the outside for the complex patient where there's probably a number of different options that are available, or it's a very complex case that maybe a couple of us will do the surgery together on to add our expertise together. So it started about, uh, I'm going to say, a year and a half ago or so, and it's really been fantastic, and we're learning from each other. I think the patient care has been outstanding. Uh, we just started uh, a few months ago to say, listen, at the end of the clinic, bring an interesting case that we can all learn from, and so we're continuing to, to uh, push forward. So it's been an incredibly valuable experience for, for the patients, for sure, and also for us as we continue to, uh, to uh, evolve. Yeah, I'll agree with that. It's a lot of fun to see you guys all collaborating together, looking at x-rays, you know, talking about certain patients. Um, I think it's really reassuring for families to know that it's a collaborative effort also. Um, within that clinic, just like most of our other clinics, are, are other disciplines involved? Physical therapy, psychology, child life? Yes. So the, answer, the short answer is yes, all those folks and the nursing team. Um, and so, it, you know, the patient really gets a great experience. They're there probably a little bit longer than a typical visit because we usually uh, have the person. So if I refer a patient into the clinic uh, to get others' uh, opinions, I'll usually see them and then I will just to kind of get an update as to where they are because sometimes I haven't seen them for a few months. And then we bring in the whole team of physicians. Um, and then if we need our psychology, our therapy team, and then the nursing team is there the whole time. So it's a, it's a really comprehensive uh, clinic uh, that serves no matter what hip condition they have, we're able to uh, really get them on the right path and, and uh, it's worked out uh, exceptionally well. Excellent. What what type of role, I mean, I know we have a, a beautiful, wonderful movement science lab here and at the Frisco campus, but what, what role does the movement science lab play for our complex adolescent hip patients? Yeah, so we, it's a great question. So um, the movement science lab, which is uh, the director's Kirsten Tolchin Francis, uh, who has been here many years, uh, every patient that has adolescent hip surgery uh, goes through the movement science lab. And in the movement science lab, it's a state-of-the-art uh, facility where the patients wear these infrared markers that are then captured, uh, their movement is captured via these high-speed cameras, and we can, to uh, each joint is identified in terms of what the range of motion is during walking. We also do some other movements today, uh, especially on the 
Frisco campus where Movement Science Lab is a little bit bigger in terms of the capacity. And uh, we're able to study the patients and uh, not only study them specifically, and if there's anything that helps us in clinical decision making, we'll use that, but also then in aggregate, we put the patients together and say, what is the outcome of doing hip dysplasia surgery? How are we doing with all these patients and can we do it better? And so a specific example was that uh, we used to do something with one of the muscles around the hip during the surgery and uh, we found out that that weakened the hip flexor power postoperatively. It came back to normal, but it was taking a little bit longer than we had hoped. And so instead of six months back to full strength, it was taking them a year. So we changed our surgical procedure so that it would be, uh, they could get that hip flexor power back sooner. And that, and then we studied that afterwards and it, it was uh, absolutely successful in doing so. So those, that's a specific example, but it uh, adds a layer and not, not many institutions are fortunate to have a movement science lab uh, that allows uh, us to do that. And we fund that with an external grant that came from one of our national organizations. And it's, it's been successful uh, in part because of that. You're listening to Checking In, a Scottish Right for Children podcast. At Scottish Right for Children, our team of experts provide world-renowned care to help kids get back to doing what they love. As leaders in pediatric orthopedics, our doctors conduct ongoing research to discover the best and most innovative treatment options for each child. We are dedicated to providing ongoing education and resources to our patients and families through our blog, which highlights various specialties, offering tips and FAQs for various conditions we treat. Meet our medical staff, learn about our history, request an appointment, and find up-to-date information about news and events happening at Scottish Rite. Visit scottishrightforchildren.org to learn more. Welcome back to Checking In, a Scottish Rite for Children podcast. You know, we talk heavily about research here at Scottish Rite. What what type of research is being done for our uh, complex adolescent hip population? So we have a prospective registry, meaning that every patient that comes uh, with a complex uh, hip condition gets enrolled in the study. And sometimes parents are reluctant to do that. But when we explain this isn't going to change anything that we're going to do for your child, it may actually be beneficial because they go through the movement science lab. And it's not only those infrared markers and how they walk, it's also we do strength testing. And uh, this is an objective person down in the movement science lab that has no idea what our exam is like. And so it gives us a good objective uh, range of motion and strength of their hip and the rest of their lower extremity. And so they get enrolled in that study and that just allows us to collect data. In this day and age, we need their signature to sort of collect the scientific data. The only additive thing is the movement science lab that we do intermittently in their pre-op stage. And then we do that post-operatively at uh, one year and then uh, two years and five years. Um, and they also fill out some questionnaires. So p patient-related outcome is really important. Um, they may tell me they're doing well, but when we ask them specific questions, they, we, we're, we're uncovering things that we didn't see beforehand. So that's one. We also have a registry for DDH. Uh, Dr. Kim has a registry for Perthes. Uh, he runs the International Perthes Study Group, which is an international study group for looking at Perthes. So that's a really uh, an important uh, study group. Uh, we also have a randomized control trial for uh, the treatment of slip capital femoral epiphysis, which is a really challenging diagnosis. And so we've been doing that study for 12 years now. And so hopefully in the next year or so, we'll have the data uh, to kind of share with uh, everybody. And I think that's improved care also. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about um, the anchor group? You know, what is that and how does it help advance care for patients with, you know, adolescent hip conditions? Yeah. So we like to be, as an academic center, we like to participate with uh, study groups that are not only here, but outside the organization. And so Anchor was started, I want to say, about 15 years ago. And uh, we're not the, the Anchor site, so to speak, excuse the pun. And uh, Anchor stands for the Academic Network for Hip Research. And so it's an international team. 
and uh, it meets once a year. It also has prospective data sets that uh, we draw from. And so we're learning from other organizations. They're learning from us. And uh, it's uh, been a very uh, active process that uh, we participate here at the hospital. And uh, uh, I think that it's beneficial to our patients because we learn from those studies. There's published data uh, that we have on all the conditions we're talking about here. And, and many of them come from the Anchor Study Group. And interesting. It's nice to know, you know, we're covering our basis with the research for all for all of our patients. Um, I want to back up to the slip capital femoral epiphysis diagnosis. Give us the, the short name that we always use for that diagnosis. Yeah. So here <laughs> in North America, we call it a skiffy. If you go down under, they call it a Sufi. So uh -huh. they say slip upper femoral epiphysis. I'm not sure which one I like better. I, th I think I like Skiffy better. But anyway, that's the term we call it. And um, it is it happens in the sort of 10 to 14-year age group is the typical age group. And what happens is the ball part of the hip slips through the growth plate, which is right below it. And generally speaking, it's because the patients are a little bit more adult size, but they still have a growth plate. And so it's important to recognize, and oftentimes they have symptoms before it starts slipping significantly. And the, the concern there or the trap there is that they oftentimes don't have hip pain. They oftentimes have knee or thigh pain. And so uh, if, they, if a child has continued thigh and knee pain that is three or four days, then oftentimes evaluation by their primary care physician or here at Scottish Rite would be important and a good two sets of x-rays are done to make that diagnosis. Uh, and there are two main forms. One is the one that's sort of chronic where they're having symptoms and it's just very, very, very slowly slipping compared to the acute one where it's probably been slipping just a little bit and all of a sudden they slip or they fall and it slips dramatically. And that one is a much more challenging one to treat and has a high air complication rate because the blood flow to the ball part of the hip is a little bit tenuous. And when it slips quickly, that blood flow can be compromised and the patient can have significant problems. Um, so that's, uh, and it's not that common either. And, uh, and so it's something to watch out for. And the pediatricians are really good for identif uh, of identifying it. Yeah, perfect. I know we get those types of referrals out in the community, and you hear the word skiffy used a lot out in the community. So right. thanks for clarifying that. Sure. Uh, a couple uh, frequently asked questions. You know, are there are there long term issues into adulthood for you know our adolescents with these hip conditions? Yeah, and the, the biggest problem is our osteoarthritis, and so for all the conditions we talk, spoke of, the problem potentially is early osteoarthritis and the need for hip replacement. Now, mind you, hip replacement has come a long, long way. And uh, for a young adult or even a middle-aged adult, it's a great operation. You go into the hospital, you have your hip replacement, the next day your pain is gone. The challenge is they don't last forever. And so if you do it in a younger patient, uh, even a young adult, imagine what they're going to do with that hip. And it's sort of like treads on the tire. The more the harder you drive, the faster the treads go away. And, and so the first set of tires last much longer than the second set of tires in a total hip replacement, and so they don't last forever. So uh, what we try to do is get those patients not having any more symptoms, because if they're having symptoms and it's pain that's coming from the hip joint itself, that means they're doing micro damage to the hip. And so the surgical procedures are beneficial to get rid of their pain or improve their pain significantly. And if we can do that, we know that the damage in the hip is far less as time goes on. And so those hips will be preserved. And that's sort of the buzz term is uh, preserving those hips over time to get them, hopefully they'll never need a hip replacement or needing it much later in life. And so imagine what you're doing at 18 years of age versus what you're doing at 28 years of age. Even if you can push that hip replacement out 10 years, and we try to certainly do it longer, it's uh, beneficial for sure. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of our parents ask, you know, if they've had, if their kiddo has surgery as an adolescent, will that prevent a hip replacement later on down the road? Yeah, it's a great question. And the short answer is uh, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, I think that what we can confidently say, though, is if we can get your symptoms much better, then you're doing less damage to the hip for sure, because that indicates you're not having, you're not creating any micro damage to the hip, and therefore the hip will last longer. Whether it lasts forever or not is a hard question to answer, but no question it will push that hip replacement out 
uh, longer and hopefully forever. And these types of patients should be followed by an orthopedist into adulthood, correct? Yes. We generally recommend that they follow, depending on how they're doing. If they have surgery, let's say at 15 years of age, we will follow them depending on uh, the condition, but we generally follow them five years, at least till five years from their surgery. And oftentimes, because they're part of the study, we will follow them out 10 years. Um, and then beyond that, they should probably see an orthopedist every few years to do a good exam, see how they're doing from a history standpoint, but also uh, an x-ray standpoint, because there are things that can be addressed that uh, will uh, hopefully allow that hip to last a much longer into their adulthood. Gotcha. Well, I think you've provided an excellent informative uh, summary, you know, regarding a lot of the complex adolescent hip conditions that we treat here at Scottish Rite. We always appreciate your expertise, um, and we've enjoyed having you today on Checking In. Thanks so much, Dr. Scotto, for being here. Well, thanks, here. Jennifer. You always do a great job. It's easy to have a conversation with you, so thank you. To learn more information about any of the topics discussed on today's podcast, check out our website at scottishrightforchildren.org. And be sure to subscribe to Checking In with Scottish Right. This podcast is a production of Scottish Right for Children. The host for this episode is Jennifer Bowden. Our producer is Maggie Dingwell. Our editor is Amy Krajewski. Our assistant editor and recording engineer is Stuart Allman. Our theme music was composed by Scott Holmes, and his music can be found at scottholmesmusic.com. Thanks for listening, and we look forward to seeing you at our next episode.